My name is John Marr from Carmen's Road Safety and it's been a pretty tough couple of years for everybody. And I feel so sorry for the schools and the students. And I actually feel a bit sorry for myself because I haven't been able to get to any schools over the past couple of years with Carmen's Road Safety message. I do thank St Joseph's College for bringing Carmen's Road Safety webinar to you guys this year. And I'm going to take you on our journey. And to do that, I go back to Sunday the 4th of April 1993. The place is Axdale, a beautiful little town just outside of Bendigo. Back then, I was aged 42. That's me, the really cute one up in the top corner there. And that's my wife, Anne. She was also 42, and she was even cuter than what I was. We had to have four beautiful children. Michelle was aged 20, Katrina 18, Jasmine was 16, and our youngest, Carmen, was aged 15. It was a beautiful Sunday morning. Ange headed off to church. This particular Sunday, I didn't go to church with Ange. Instead, I was going to a cricket function. I was the captain coach of the Sedgwick Cricket Club, and we just won the premiership. So we had barbecues set up on Axe Creek and we were going to celebrate what we'd achieved. I borrowed my eldest daughter Michelle's car and I headed off towards the barbecues about a half an hour after Ange had left. As I went into Axdale, I was in the 80 kilometre zone, slowing towards 60. I saw a four-wheel drive coming towards me out of the 60 kilometre zone when I noticed it lose control. So I came to a complete stop on the highway and I sat there. The four-wheel drive veered across the road really quickly in front of me. I thought it was going into the trees, but instead it swerved back again. It rolled. It bounced up in the air and it bounced so high, I lost sight of it above the roof line of my car. And the next thing I know, the lights went out because the four-wheel drive had landed upside down on the roof and bonnet of my car. I was knocked unconscious, and when I came to for the first time, I heard someone outside the car saying, whoever is in there has got to be dead. I called out to him and I said, I'm okay in here, and I immediately passed out. The next time I came to, I heard Ange screaming out to me from outside the car. She'd been calling out to me for about 10 minutes when I came to for the second time. I said, Ange, I'm okay. I've got a broken nose, a broken jaw, a broken foot, but a particular part of my anatomy was still intact. She said the two guys had a bit of a laugh about that. She didn't, but she did realise that I must have been okay. I passed out again. The next time I came to, an ambulance officer had been able to get in the back door of the car on the passenger side. He had to get under the seats he was on his back and he woke me up asking me if I could reach my arm out so he could put a drip in my arm. And he said to me, what's your name? How old are you? Do you know what day it is? Do you know what time it is? And do you know what's happened? I answered all of those questions and he said, mate, I can't believe it, but I think you might be okay. Again, I passed out. The next time I came to, I said to him, how are the people in the other car? He said, the young lady is deceased. I was trapped in the car for an hour and 50 minutes. And the next time I remember anything clearly, I had woken up in St John of God's Hospital in intensive care. And Ange was sitting beside the bed. I looked at Ange and I said, am I going to make it? Because I'm telling you, I felt lousy. Ange said, the doctors are really happy with how you've come through the operation and you're going to be okay. The result of the car crash was that there was one death. I was really seriously injured. And I can tell you that my life, my family's lives and the lives of so many of our friends were changed forever from that day forwards. Emma Hayward was aged 18 years and 24 days. Emma had had a license for just 23 days when she lost control of the four-wheel drive 
that her dad had brought for her to keep her safe. She rolled up the highway, bounced up in the air, landed upside down on the roof and bonnet of my car, and poor Emma was killed instantly. I met Emma's dad six weeks after the car crash when he called out home to see me. He said, I'm really sorry for what's happened to you, John. And he just lost his daughter. He then said, I bought that car for her to keep her safe. And I've killed my only child. Not only was Emma an only child, she was also an only grandchild. And guys, eight months later, Emma's mum and dad split up, never to get back together again. And one thing that I was learning really quickly as I'm walking up and down in a hydro pool for six months trying to get my body working again, as I'm seeing physiotherapists every fortnight and I was under four specialists who were poking and prodding at me, I was really quickly learning that a car crash is not just a car crash. A car crash is the most violent experience you will ever have. And you will live or die 100% based on luck. I'm hoping that most of you are currently learning to drive, if not already have your license. But those of you who are not learning to drive, I hope by the end of this presentation you all commit to learn to drive and you realise that in Victoria you have to do 120 hours of learning to drive before you can go for your licence. I can tell you that my, one of my grandsons has just got his licence three weeks ago and he did 268 hours. Max, who will go for his licence in the next three months, has already done 170 hours. Why? For the simple fact that 120 hours is just five days of learning to drive a motor vehicle, a one and a half ton motor vehicle, and it is simply not enough. When it's pouring rain and you're going out to a friend's place, ask your mum and dad if you can drive. And when they say no because the weather's too bad, let them know that one day, when you have your licence, you may have to drive in these weather conditions and you would rather learn with them sitting beside you. I can tell you, the most dangerous time of every driver's life is in the first six months after you get your license. But you know, don't you? It'll never happen to you. You do hear about it happening to lots of other people. And in fact, someone is killed on an Australian road every single day. I'll tell you now just how fragile our lives really are. On the 18th of November, 1995, just two and a half years after I had my car crash in which poor Emma lost her life, Carmen, our beautiful youngest daughter, aged 18 years and three months, was killed in a car crash. Carmen got her license first go. I taught all of my girls to drive and Carmen was by far the best driver of all of them when she went for her licence. So how can this happen to Carmen? How can this happen to us? How could this happen to your family and you? I'll tell you. It was a beautiful Saturday morning. And I have here a photo of Michelle and Carmen. This photo was taken about two years before we lost Carmen. And if I'd have known what was going to happen to Carmen, 
I'd have taken a lot more photos of these two girls just together on their own. But I didn't. None of us did. It was a beautiful Saturday morning, and normally of a Saturday, Carmen would sleep in until about 11 o'clock, probably just like some of you do. Michelle was an apprenticed hairdresser, and she started work at 8.30. So at 7.30, Michelle went down into the kitchen, and here was Carmen, already up, fully dressed, in the kitchen, sitting at the kitchen table. She had her arms on the table, she had her head in her arms, and she was asleep. Michelle got a real shock and she said, Carmen, what are you doing up? What had happened the night before Carmen's very best friend, Carmen Trevine? That's Carmen Trevine and that's our Carmen. Carmen Trevine had come out and stayed the night, just like she had done hundreds of times before, because these two Carmens were the very best of best friends. Carmen Trevine a Year 12 student at Catholic College in Bendigo, worked part-time at McDonald's in Bendigo of a weekend. Carmen Trevine, also 18, hadn't even started to learn to drive. So our Carmen had to run her into work. Carmen Trevine walked into the kitchen and she said, come on, Carmen, let's go. So the two Carmens went out to the car, but Michelle went out with them. Michelle was 23, a lot more experienced. When they got to the car, Michelle said, Carmen, you're tired. Wind the window down, turn the wireless up. You'll be right, mate. I'll catch you later. And she gave her a big thumbs up. I was getting dressed in the bedroom and I heard Carmen toot as she went out our front gate for the 20 minute drive into Bendigo. Our girls always gave us a toot as they left home. Michelle went back inside and got ready for work. At 10 past 8, Michelle got in her car to go into work. She left home, gave us a toot, drove down to McIver Highway where you turn right to go in towards Bendigo. It's a T intersection. When she pulled up at McIver Highway, she looked right and you could see at least a kilometre up the highway and there were no cars coming. And she said her heart nearly stopped. She thought to herself, I should be seeing Carmen by now. She turned right, and as she was driving in towards Bendigo, she said she started to feel sick. She felt like vomiting, because there were still no cars coming, and this is the McIver Highway. She knew there was something wrong, and in her heart, she knew that whatever it was, it was to do with Carmen. Just five, just five short kilometres from home. Michelle came over a small rise, and this is what she found. Thank God Carmen had dropped Carmen Trevine off at McDonald's in Bendigo. But can you believe that on the way home, our beautiful little girl could go to sleep at the wheel at 100 kilometres an hour and crash into this tree? Not with the bonnet, not with the boot, not with the back door, exactly with the driver's side door of her car. And Carmen was killed instantly. Michelle pulled up and went running towards Carmen's car. Michelle was the third car on the scene. Fortunately for us, a young police officer was just standing right there beside the car. He saw Michelle running towards the car and he strapped, stepped out and he grabbed her in front of the bonnet and he said, where do you think you're going, young lady? Michelle said, that's my sister in that car and I'm going to take her home. He said, I can't let you go there. Michelle said, that's my sister in there and I'm taking her home. He said, I'm really sorry, but I can't let you go there. Michelle could see the blanket. She could see the condition of the car. She then said to this young policeman, is Carmen all right? The young policeman burst into tears. He said, I'm really sorry, but your sister is dead. 
Michelle started screaming. She started wrestling with the policeman, fighting with him, trying to get to Carmen. She actually punched him in the face to try and get away from him, but thankfully he held her tighter. Michelle then pleaded with him. She said, please let me go to Carmen. She's in that car on her own. I need to be with Carmen. I need to hold Carmen's hand. He said, I'm really sorry, but I can't let you do that. Then Michelle said to him, but you don't understand. It's my fault that Carmen is dead. I let Carmen drive when I knew she was tired. Even today, Michelle, who is 49, still blames herself for Carmen's death. No one else does. I certainly don't. Because I can tell you that when I worked, I always, always, always drove my car when I was tired. And 90% of all drivers have driven their car while they're tired. I used to go from Bendigo to Melbourne to a conference or to a meeting. On the way home, I'd start to get tired at about Heathcote and I'd start to yawn. And a yawn is the first sign of fatigue when you're driving a car. And then I'd yawn again, but I wouldn't stop. No, it was still only a half an hour till home. I'd keep going. And often, I'd take what's called the micro-sleep, where you close your eyes and then you wake up again. But in that time, you can do 100 metres doing that. And I did that on a number of occasions. Since Carmen's death, I can assure each and every one of you that I have never, ever driven my car while I've been tired. I still get tired, but what I do now, as soon as I yawn, or as soon as I realise I'm getting tired, I pull over immediately. And I can do that because when I'm going anywhere, I always leave an hour early. Always. And I recommend that for everyone. And then you can enjoy your drive. So when I pull over, I have what's called a power nap. And I know that you will have all heard of a power nap. I pull over, I take my phone out of my pocket, I set the alarm for 15 to 30 minutes, whatever I think I need, I lay the seat back, and I go straight to sleep. I've taught myself to do that. When the alarm goes off, or even if I wake up before the alarm, this is the most important part of my power nap. I get out of the car and I go for a brisk walk up the road as fast as I can. If I could run, I would. And then I go 100 metres up the road and I come 100 metres back again as fast as I can. And I am puffing. The adrenaline's pumping. And I get back in the car and now it is impossible to go to sleep. And I am therefore a safe driver for myself, for every other road user, but most importantly, I am a safe driver for the people who love me so much. My family, especially my six wonderful grandchildren. You see, I can never do to my family what Carmen has done to us. Ange and I and Jasmine were standing at the back of our car. We were going into Bendigo and we were waiting for Carmen to come home to take her in with us. We were waiting for a fair while. Then I heard a car come up Hawkins Lane, saw the flashes of white go behind our trees, and a car turned in our driveway. But it wasn't Carmen. It was a police car. We walked over to the police car. A young policeman got out of that car crying crying. I said, can I help you? He said, there's been a car accident and it's Carmen and she's gone. I said, where's she gone to? He said, it's Carmen and she's gone. That's all he could get out. He was crying that much. I got really angry. I said, mate, what are you talking about? Where's Carmen gone to? 
Just then, the back door of the police car opened and Michelle stepped out with tears streaming down her face. And we all heard the words that we will never, ever forget from Michelle. She looked at us and she said, Dad, Carmen's dead. Just like that. And I'm telling you that that is pretty much how your mum and dad, your brothers and sisters, will hear about your death in a car crash. And I'll tell you, you'll be like Carmen. You see, Carmen was the lucky one that day. Carmen was killed instantly. But we have just heard that Carmen's been killed in this car crash. We're all holding each other, everyone crying, including this magnificent young police officer. I said, where has this happened? They said, near the Farmer's Arms Hotel. I said, I have to go there. It mightn't be Carmen. So I pulled myself away and went walking quickly towards my car. Michelle was screaming out from behind me, Dad, don't go there. Please don't go there, Dad. And somehow this young policeman beat me to the door of my car. He put his back up against the driver's side door of the car. He looked at me and he went like this. He said, please, Mr. Marr, I beg of you. Please don't go to the crash scene. Your family needs you here. And guys, that day, I made the biggest mistake of my entire life. I stayed with Ange, Michelle and Jasmine, which was indeed the right thing to do. But you know what this dad didn't do? I didn't go to Carmen. She was just five kilometres away. I left Carmen in that car on her own with strangers to look after her. And I can never undo that decision. What I want you all to do now is to look really close at me up in the corner of this video. And I want you to replace me. This is no longer John Marr up in the corner. This is your dad. Or it may even be your incredibly brave mum. Talking to next year's group of students in your school. And they're telling them how they lost you in a car crash or when you were crossing the road or when you were on your push bike. And they're telling them what you have done to them. You haven't done it to yourself. Carmen didn't do it to herself. She did this to us. And your mum and dad will have to do what we did. We went inside with the police officer. He put the kettle on. We're sitting at the kitchen table with our arms around each other, crying and saying prayers for Carmen. And then it dawned on me. I have to ring Katrina, our second eldest daughter. She's in Sydney. She works in Sydney. She's 21 years old. She's the assistant manager of the second largest Bets and Bets shoe store in Australia. And I have to give her this terrible news. I rang the Bets and Bets shoe store and thankfully the manager answered the phone. I told him what I had to tell Katrina and asked him to stand by and support her if he could. Katrina came to the phone. And before I could say anything, Katrina said, Dad, fancy you ringing me on a Saturday morning. I didn't even want to come to work today, Dad. This is sensational. You've made my day. I said, Treen, I've got some really, really bad news to tell you. Treen, there's been a car accident. And Treen, I'm sorry, it's Carmen. And Trina, Carmen is dead. Can you make your mum or your dad make this phone call to your brother or sister? 
What I heard on the other end of the phone will be similar to what they will hear. I heard Katrina saying, No, Dad. No, Dad. No, Dad. Not Carmen, Dad. No, Dad. No! Then she dropped the phone in the Bets and Bets shoe store and I could hear poor little Trina screaming at the top of her voice, Carmen, 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 Carmen! And I couldn't even do anything about it. I couldn't hold her. We spoke for a while. But I said to Katrina, I have to ring Mum and Dad. And Katrina wanted to keep speaking to me because she needed support. But I had to make all of these phone calls. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done was to hang up from Katrina on that phone call. I rang Mum and Dad at Bungaree. Mum and Dad were both 69 years old. I was hoping Dad would answer the phone because as we know, Mums are really weird people. They know stuff. They have this sixth sense about everything. I rang the phone and of course, Mum answered it. I said, Mum, is Dad there? She said, John, what's wrong? Just like that. I said, I just need to talk to Dad, Mum. She said, John, you tell me what's wrong now. I said, Mum, there's been a car accident. I've got some really bad news. It's Carmen. And Mum, I'm really sorry, but Carmen is dead. I heard my poor old Mum scream out to Dad, Jack, 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 my God, Jack! Carmen's been killed in a car crash. How? Could Carmen make me do that to my mum? How can you do this to your family? I then rang the rest of my family. Brendan Carmen's dead, Peter Carmen's dead, Gavin Carmen's dead, Carmel Carmen's dead and Terry Carmel's dead. I then kept on with my dead phone calls. I rang Angie's family. Huey Carmen's dead, Jim Carmen's dead, Frank Carmen's dead, Jacko Carmen's dead, and Mari up at Maruchidor. Carmen's dead. We had a Teledex beside the phone. You mightn't know what a Teledex is. We have all of our phone numbers now in our iPhones. A Teledex was a little thing like this. It had a slider on it, and it went from A to Z, and in there were all of my friends' phone numbers, all of Michelle's, Katrina's, Jasmine's, Angie's, and all of Carmen's friends' phone numbers were in our yellow Teledex. And between Angie and I, we rang more than 160 people. But we didn't have to ring them all, because I'd made about 20 phone calls. And I put my hand on the receiver to ring the next number, and the phone rang, and it frightened the living daylights out of me. I picked it up. I said, John speaking. And someone on the end of the phone screamed out to me, John, please tell me it's not true. And I couldn't. Guys, this really did change our lives dramatically. But this is a family's worst nightmare. But I've never been so proud of six young girls in my entire life. There's Michelle. Katrina, who was in Sydney. There's Jasmine. Their cousins Lisa, Alison and Julie just over the back. There's my mum and dad just up behind me. That's me there. That's Angie's sister who has since passed away. Do you know what these brave, brave girls are doing? They are carrying their sister and their cousin out of St. Teresa's Church at the biggest funeral I have ever been to in my life. And I have been to plenty. This is the best part of my presentation. This is where I get to introduce you all to our beautiful Carmen. This video was taken on Christmas Day, just under two years before we lost Carmen. Good evening, and 
on Carmen Ma for the second edition of the Ten O'Clock News. Okay, now, oh, as you can see, we are in the Ma, in the Ma house at Christmas dinner. Now, yes, it is a great occasion for the whole family. <laughs> We have lollies <laughs> and cake and we, yes, and we're and putting in around the corner which you, which you can come and join us if you want. We're and that's all and there'll be money and pudding, you know, a great Christmas dinner. It's just a fabulous. What's the menu? The menu of Christmas. Hey, nobody's the menu of Christmas. Right, now we're going to have to go to the menu of Christmas. Okay, now, if we come this way, excuse me, let's do it. Now that is the one special thing about it. The love in the heart that comes out from the whole family is to give presents as you can see. She's pretty cool, isn't she? And did you hear the last thing that she talked about? The love in our hearts. And I'm telling you, you must understand who you are. You are the most important person in the world to the people who love you so much. And Carmen is still the most important person in the world because we love her so much. So what do we miss the most about Carmen? We have a life without Carmen. And what we all miss the most is that we can't give Carmen a cuddle. A cuddle. I would give anything to be able to cuddle Carmen just one more time. And I can assure you that that is exactly what your family will miss the most about you. And so too will your friends. You see, we are a really cuddly family. And we all give and get cuddles all the time. This is my family now. All of my girls have two children each, and so do their husbands, of course. And we are so proud of our family. We're incredibly proud of these people, our grandchildren. Having six grandchildren makes me a grandfather, and I know what you're thinking. He just doesn't look old enough to be a grandfather, but I am. And I can tell you that Ange and I live for our grandchildren. It is the greatest time of life. And if you haven't spoken to your grandparents lately, give them a telephone call if they're not close by. Go and see them if you possibly can and give them the biggest cuddle you can possibly give them and tell them, more importantly, how much you love them and appreciate them. Because I'm telling you, that you are the apple in their eyes. So why are there so many deaths on our roads? We have just come to the end of February and I'm giving you here, and I'm not big on facts and figures, but these are staggering. Live lost year to date, to midnight on the 28th of February. In 2021, last year, there were 35 lives lost to that date. This year, we are up by 40% to 49 people killed on our roads in Victoria. 49 family members. 49 people who were taken to the cemetery and buried like we had to do with our beautiful Carmen. And we had to turn and walk out of that cemetery. And I left my little girl behind. What about the deaths on Victorian roads to the 28th of February? In rural Victoria, there have been 31 deaths against 18 city deaths. And that is always the case. This number here last year was 21 in the city to 14 in the country at the same time. And I can tell you by the end of the year, 
there was two thirds more deaths in the country than what there were on metropolitan roads. And that will be exactly the same again this year. Two thirds more people get killed on country roads. The projected deaths on Victorian roads for 2022 are the 228 males and 88 females. Will one of those statistics be you? I am hoping that Carmen is empowering you here today and that you definitely will not be one of those because you will make a difference on the roads and you will be the safest road user you can possibly be. Speed is still one of the biggest killers on our roads. Guys, if you see 100 kilometres an hour on a signpost, don't go over 100. If you see 40 as you're going post, past a school, don't go over 40. If you see 60, this is really simple stuff. Don't go over 60. Why? Because they are the road laws and they are proven to be the safe speeds that you can travel at. Why, ev why is everyone in such danger on our roads? This will give you a really good example. Victoria Police Report. Officers followed the stolen car from Footscray through North Melbourne, Brunswick, Brunswick East, Fitzroy, Carlton North, and then onto Separation Street, Northcote, where the stolen car increased its speeds to over 150 kilometres per hour. If you haven't already worked it out, these, we're talking about going through suburbs in Melbourne, where it's 60. The police air wing took up position and followed the vehicle through Preston, Coburg, Faulkner, Epping, before the vehicle was disabled on Cooper Street, Epping, where the offenders attempted to flee the vehicle. Two males and three female teens offenders were arrested at the scene. What I would like to make a comment here on is, thank God for the police. Guys, they get a terrible rap. But I'm telling you, only for our police, the road deaths would soar. And if you get pulled over by a police officer, that police officer is doing their job and trying to keep you safe and trying to keep people around you safe understand that. I have the greatest respect for the police and the greatest appreciation for them because they came to our house with the worst news you can possibly get. If they hadn't have stopped this chase and been able to stop that vehicle, they may not have been just booking these teenagers. They would have been calling around to their family homes knocking on the door and letting mum and dad know that their son or their daughter has just been killed on the roads. Thank heavens for the police. The school holidays have proven to me over the years that they are the most dangerous time of any young person's life. Why? It's like when there was COVID and you were sitting at home and the teachers were trying to educate you remotely. Boredom sets in. And that's when you find young people particularly stealing cars, driving unregistered vehicles, drinking and driving, taking risks, egging their mates on to drive faster. I'll ask you a question here. And you don't have to put up your hand. But when I'm at a school, I do ask people to put up their hands. Have you ever been in a car where you felt really unsafe? And I can tell you now that 90% of you would have put your hands up if I was in your schoolroom right now. And the reason you feel unsafe is because your life 
is in danger because of what that driver is doing. And you must speak up. If you're not going to speak up for yourself, please speak up for mum and dad because they don't want to bury you like we had to bury our beautiful Carmen. Mobile phone use while driving. Every single one of you has seen the driver who's been driving you in the car on their mobile phone. They've had it up to their ear. They've been talking. They've sometimes been texting. If they're that good a driver, they think they can text. Guys, if someone is doing that, even if it's a family member, even if it's your dad, tell him he must stop because it's proven that people die when someone is using a mobile phone while driving. Point oh five is still a killer on our roads. And everyone knows that you cannot drive while point over 0.05. And you guys know when you get your license, you must be double zero. One in every 482 drivers tested last year were over 0.05. One in 482. But that is still not the biggest killer on our road. Have a listen to this. Drug driving is now the biggest killer on our roads. It poses the greatest risk. According to the latest statistics given to the Public Accounts and Estimates Committee, ice and ecstasy are the most risky, increasing the dangers and the chance of a crash by up to 24 times. 24 times. Can you all do me a favour? I want everyone to get your license so that you can be the safe driver on our roads and you can look after everybody in your car. You have an incredible responsibility. You are responsible 100% for looking after your passenger. But if you are in the drug scene or wanting to get into the drug scene, do yourself your mum and dad and your brothers and sisters, your schoolmates and everybody else, a massive favour. Never, ever, ever get your licence and never sit behind the steering wheel of a car because you are 24 times more likely to have a crash because you're so impaired. And why are less people wearing seatbelts? This is the thing that really is blowing me out of the water. There's so many people in crashes now where the police report comes out where they were ejected from the vehicle because they weren't wearing seatbelts. Not wearing seatbelts doubles your chance of dying in a car crash. Doubles your chance. Of all of the lawful numbers that made up last year's shocking road toll, there's none more puzzling than this one. Of the 266 people killed, 31 of those were not wearing a seatbelt. Guys, when I sit in the driver's seat or passenger seat of my car, the very first thing I do is I pull on my seatbelt. That's the first thing I do. And I've done it all my life, thankfully. Get in the habit. And here's another tip for you. When you get in the passenger seat of a car and you pull on your seatbelt to keep yourself safe, this is what you actually do. You gift your life to the driver. You gift your one and only life to a driver of that motor vehicle and then you sit back and I can tell you that that driver now has your life 100% in their hands and you will live or die depending on what he or she does next. So if you are feeling unsafe, please speak up. It is your life and you only have one chance, one crack at this life. Carmen has a roadside memorial just outside of Bendigo near Longley where we lived five kilometres from our home. We now live in Ballarat 
But every time we go back to Bendigo, we go out and we put flowers at Carmen's Roadside Memorial. I can tell you, I would much rather have Carmen in my life than that lump of granite and Carmen's photo and those beautiful flowers there. These are some family photos and thankfully we've got thousands of family photos that have Carmen in them. These were our girls when they were little and little are again. And here is a fancy dress photo. We were going to a fancy dress so we dressed up as school kids and I looked like the biggest school kid of the lot. Here's Carmen, have a look at her, the cheeky one. She loved life so much. And on Carmen's arm it had I love mum and dad in texter. Michelle is wearing my old St Paul's blazer plus my, my tie. And look at me, I'm wearing Michelle's netball skirt. Don't I look pretty cool, hey? If you ever see Carmen's road safety car in Echuca, Moama, Ballarat, Bendigo, wherever you might be, please come up and say hello. Carmen's photo is on the side of the car and I'd love to hear from you that you've heard Carmen's road safety message. I'd love to hear from you that you are a great driver, a safe driver and that you give your mum and dad massive cuddles. The moment that you get home from school today, drop your school bag, go straight to your mum and give your mum the biggest cuddle you have ever given your mum in your life. When you see your dad, give your dad a monster cuddle. Give your brothers and sisters cuddles. And if you're with your best friend here today at school, give your friends massive cuddles. But never ever give a cuddle away cheaply because a cuddle is a great, one of the greatest forms of affection that there is. And guys, I have some incredible news. I have finally finished Carmen's Legacy. This is Carmen's book. I'll hold it up where you can hopefully see it properly. Whoops, look at that. Carmen's Legacy. It's taken me 20 years to write Carmen's Legacy. And it will be available mid-March. The price of the book will be $19.99. So 20 bucks. I hope you guys are empowered by Carmen's story. Go to Carmen's website, carmenroadsafety.com.au or send me an email to get a copy of Carmen's Legacy. It's a great read. It's an incredible present for a learner driver. It would be an amazing present for you to give to your mum or dad or to your brother or sister or a best friend at $20. This could save a life. It's time that we took our lives back. Take back the responsibility for being the safest road user you can possibly be. And look after your own life. And while you're doing that, look after the lives of everyone you love and other people on the roads. And I always finish off with Carmen's bookmark. This is a bookmark that I put together. It has Carmen's photo on the front and it says fatigue, fatigue, fatigue because fatigue is how Carmen lost her life on the roads. But when I had my car crash two and a half years before we lost Carmen, I was in intensive care in hospital and my girls all brought me in a get well card. Carmen's get well card has become famous because I've reproduced the wording of Carmen's Get Well card on the, on the back of this bookmark. And Carmen said to me, Dad, I love you. I love you more than anything. The feeling of darkness, the feeling of loneliness, the feeling of not having a father nearly broke my heart. 
The feeling of not seeing you was like a bomb going off inside of me. The thought, the pain that went through us all was like a nothing. A nothing that swept our hearts. A nothing that dug deeper and deeper every minute, every second of the day. But then to hear your voice and to see your face, it gave me that love. That love that every one of us thought we had lost. I love you, Dad. I love you more than anything. Love, Carmen. And guys, just two and a half, really short years later, we lost our beautiful Carmen forever. And today, on behalf of Ange, Michelle, Katrina, Jasmine and myself, Carmen is our gift to all of you. Take Carmen into your hearts. Take her with you as you use the roads. Thank your school for bringing Carmen into your lives. And I would ask your school that they provide you with Carmen's link to this webinar. And you can go home, sit down with your family and replay Carmen's message for them. And maybe you can save a life as well. Feel free also to send the link on to any friend, any family member that might not get the opportunity to hear Carmen's story. Stay safe always and thank you.